Good afternoon, everyone. I am Christine Ortiz Gamina with the National Environmental Health Association. Thank you for joining us today for the Cyanobacteria Assessment Network mobile application webinar. A little background on the webinar series, NEHA and the EPA has joined together to start a, a collaboration that promotes each other's work along with producing webinar series. This is our second year producing these webinars. Today's presentation will be on the Cyan app, which is a mobile application that uses satellite data to map the location of harmful algal blooms in waters across the US. The app provides weekly information about cyanobacteria concentration and many of the largest water bodies in the country. This information can be used to inform decisions regarding recreational and drinking water safety. The app is designed for use on Android devices and is available for download on Google Play. This webinar will provide a general overview of the app, including what it's used for, why, and how it was developed. A bit of housekeeping, all webinar participants should be on listen only mode. This webinar is being recorded. If you're not okay with this being recorded, you can disconnect at this time. Also, there will be a Q&A session at the end of the presentation. Please hold all questions until then. Q&A will be conducted via the web chat box. Feel free to enter any questions you have via the chat box throughout the webinar and we'll address the questions at the end of the presentation. I will now pass it to Bailey Stern with the Science Communication Outreach CCS at the EPA's Office of Research and Development. She will be introducing our speakers today. Thank you, Bailey, for joining us. I'll turn it over to you. Thanks, Christina. Hi, everyone. I'm Bailey Stearns. I'm with EPA's ORD. Um, our first speaker today is Dr. John Johnston. He is a supervisory research ecologist with Office of Research and Development in Athens, Georgia. His research focuses on water quality monitoring and modeling, to forecast ecosystem services and their influence on human health. Our last speaker is Dr. Blake Schaefer. Blake is a physical scientist with EPA's Office of Research and Development in Durham, North Carolina. His research focuses on the use of satellite remote sensing technology to monitor water quality in coasts, estuaries, and lakes. Um, please welcome John Johnston. All right, thank you, Bailey. Can you hear me? Yeah. Good. And uh, thanks to you, Christine, for hosting the webinar. And we'd also like to thank Suzanne Van Drunick of the Safe and Sustainable Water Resources National Research Program of the US EPA Office of Research and Development. So as a little bit of background, just hanging on this title slide, uh, cyanobacteria are a cosmopolitan group. They occur throughout the world, and they can cause harmful algal blooms, or HABs. HABs are considered a decrease in the health status of an aquatic ecosystem, whether related to blooms that are unsightly, noxious, odorous, uh, or include the release of toxins that can affect human health, pets, livestock, and wildlife. Routes of exposure include inhalation, ingestion, um, and by skin contact with water and aerosols. HABs have the potential to cause adverse health, ecosystem, and economic impacts. Next slide. And I'd like to make the distinction here between the multi-agency Cyan project that involves NOAA, NASA, USGS, and the EPA, and the mobile application called Cyan itself. The goal of the Cyan mobile app is to deliver um, near real-time satellite data on bloom status for freshwater lakes and reservoirs to the public. And this is making satellite information accessible, easy to use, requiring no technical expertise. Um, and although the Android platform was targeted initially for this development, we do plan to have a, we call it a responsive web app uh, that would be cross-platform as the next version of this tool uh, within a year. And so this will work across various devices in the office or in the field via web browsers. So going back to the figure, the Cyan Project partners are depicted here, beginning in the bottom right with NOAA, who have primary responsibility for imagery classification, 
they develop the algorithms to detect and forecast HABs. They also have primary responsibility for marine systems and the Great Lakes. Uh, moving counterclockwise, NASA next has primary responsibility for satellite data processing. This includes evaluation, validation, and quality control of the data. They provide um, the U.S. cyanobacterial satellite product for cyan. The USGS, then moving a little further to that top left, has primary responsibility for field freshwater HAB monitoring. So they have the ecological expertise and, uh, and field personnel. They're also taking the lead on Landsat satellite management and hosting a surface water temperature product in the future. And um, last but not least, the EPA, so Blake and I and, uh, and the others on the Cyan team within the EPA, the agency, as well as ORD, um, we have primary responsibility for the Cyan mobile app. Um, so we, we are developing, testing, and releasing it. And uh, so the Office of Research and Development, um, it's, look again, who we work for, uh, works with the Office of Water. So that's our primary client office within the agency, but also the regions and states that are um, the primary users, suppliers. They, they're the folks in the field that need this information and, and this early warning system. And so the EPA regions, 10 of them, um, in working with the states are, are, um, are a big part of how we've rolled this out and, um, and communicate with the states. Next slide. So the platform we're using for the data is the Sentinel-3 Ocean Satellite and Land Color Instrument, um, and we call it OLCHI for short. Um, this animation is from the European Space Agency, also called ESA, um, on the satellite in orbit. So the image in the lower right is an example of what a single day looks like across the U.S. and is why we say an image takes several days of passes. So every two to three days um, is a satellite pass, and so within a week you get a complete um, picture, hopefully. Um, and that is provided there are no cloud cover or data quality issues. Um, so that complete scene for the lower 48 would be possible with multiple passes. And keep in mind, these are surface water measurements, so they're limited to the top few uh, meters, maybe one, two meters at the most um, of the water column. And that, of course, depends on water clarity, uh, the presence of solids that interfere with light penetration. Um, in bloom waters, especially really active ones, the measurements might even be a half meter or within centimeters of the surface. The spatial resolution, um, I guess the better way of describing that is the extent um, of each of the cells um, is 300 meters, uh, which is three football or soccer fields for context. Um, and this poses a limitation for detecting blooms in smaller water bodies. And we'll say more about that um, on later slides. And we'd like to convey our appreciation to ESA and UMETSTAT for uh, the use of the satellite platform for Cyan. Next slide, please. So as with any research and development effort, there are known issues and limitations of the product, and we need to want to state those up front. Um, so beginning with that image in the top right with the white bounding box, um, that's what we call a mixed pixel. And that mixed pixel includes land and water and will therefore have errors due to the different optical properties of those surfaces. So for this reason, the methodology is more robust and so more reliable in water bodies that are larger and have three 300 meter cells in both the north-south and east-west direction, so for a total of nine cells. And that way, land effects would be avoided uh, and the interior value might be the one that you'd have the highest confidence in. Um, in the lower left, there are also issues when lake and reservoir boundaries change. And we assume a constant boundary in the year. So droughts, floods, extreme events pose a challenge for us in that, so in this case, uh, a winter drawdown of a reservoir resulted in a substantial increase in land area, looking almost like exposed beaches on the top right and in the center there. So those light brown areas uh, are then exposed, which affects how we're treating the data because now we've introduced more land area. 
ice and snow, so that's the bottom right image, also have different optical properties. Therefore, data processing does now include, um, and has for a while, QA flags for these known issues related to mixed pixels and snow and ice. Um, and so just wanting to be clear, um, the data and images provided through Cyan and the mobile app should be considered provisional because there may be errors. Um, in situ measurements, and we'll show you some of that validation data in a bit, that were collected in the field are advised to confirm the presence of a bloom identified in the app. Also, data provided by the Cyan mobile app include smaller water bodies, um, and these, of course, are greater in number than the larger lakes and reservoirs. Um, but these require more validation and interpretation due to these known issues. So next slide. Validation is an important step, and so we've tried to anticipate some of the questions that we get most frequently as we've given this webinar. Um, and this is one of them. So how has it been validated? Um, both the uh, cyan chlorophyll and cyanobacteria results um, were compared with grab samples taken in the field. Although many of the samples uh, in the USGS field database were collected in Minnesota and Florida, as you can see these denser blue areas on the map, um, and this is approximately 4,500 bottle samples, these were compared with matched time series data from 2002 to 2012 across 26 states. So the algorithm performed well, especially in the range of 10 to 100 micrograms per liter. And this work described on this uh, slide is in preparation for publication. Next slide. And the cyanobacterial abundance was also compared to field data to evaluate its performance and the methodology. And there is, as you can see, strong agreement across several orders of magnitude. And this is cells per milliliter. So this work as well has been published, and there are two papers on the left. Um, and the take home message here is that the satellite results match field observations quite well. Next slide. So this is a question we receive regularly, and now with over 1,000 downloads from the Google Play Store, more and more people are interested in checking the water bodies near them for potentially hazardous blooms, whether it's jogging, um, unsightly views, odors, as we mentioned before, um, worried about their pets. There are issues this summer in the newspaper with um, poisoning of, um, of dogs that happened in the southeast. Um, more and more people are, are using it, and, um, and so it's uh, something that isn't just limited potentially in use to the major water body shown here, although that is where we've done uh, the, uh, the majority of the, uh, the work in these initial publications. So these are the um, location of the 2,300 and so, maybe 2,300, 2,400 major water bodies across the continental U.S. that are resolvable um, due to their large spatial extent. So we have greater confidence in the results related to these water bodies for the limitations uh, mentioned earlier. Um, you know, larger lakes and reservoirs are made up of numerous of the um, remotely sense data. So these cells that are within uh, the scenes that cover. And, um, and as I said before, this isn't to say Cyan is unable to provide bloom information on smaller lakes and even larger ponds. However, um, they are subject to error and should be verified. This grid, the white hatching in, in this image over the US indicates various tiles of satellite data that are processed for Cyan. And the publication describing um, the mobile app uh, is shown on the left. And we'll have that on a couple more slides. Next slide. And this is another question we get. How does one interpret the Cyan weekly value, which is a really good question. The answer is that a single maximum value is provided for each week. So that is each app weekly data presents, represents the maximum detected value for that week of measurements. So in this example, there was no satellite data on Sunday, Wednesday, Friday, or Saturday and that could have been due to something like cloud cover. Um, the satellite did provide a measurement on Monday, but it was not above the minimum detection limit, which is colored in gray here. 
On Tuesday, um, a value of 50,000 cells per milliliter were detected, and on Thursday, the value increased to 200,000. Therefore, at this location, this week, that value of 200,000 cells per milliliter was reported by Cyan. Next slide. And so we're getting into the mobile app um, itself now. Um, and these are screenshots. Moving now to the look and feel of the mobile app and its various features, looking from the national to the local scale. So moving from left to right. Um, in the Cyan mobile app screenshot on the left, pin markers are indicated for water bodies of interest all across the US. So this is a quick way of looking at status at a glance. In the middle screen, weekly results can be viewed for a location of interest where you're looking at the scenes. So this is the, the data itself then being delivered um, at a glance uh, for that pin of interest. The right-hand screenshot shows a more detailed view, though, from the perspective of water bodies, and this is where it gets into um, the number of cells that could potentially make up um, the larger water bodies, especially the larger lakes and reservoirs, that 2,400. They have a lot of, of detail going on there. Next slide. So to simplify the information delivered through the app, so we're not going to deliver all scenes for all locations every week. Um, that would result in delays and, and lags um, for a person trying to access it through their phone. So we're trying to minimize that and keep it to what's of interest. Uh, so cyan only reports when a cyan of bloom is detected. So that minimum detection limit is around 10,000 cells per mil. That may have changed as that was being looked at, and Blake can say more about that if that has changed slightly, but that's near the, the lower end. Um, and there are three types of detections in the data. Um, one, cyanobacteria were detected. Two, um, there was water but there was no detection of cyanobacteria, and three is no data. So either clouds again, a quality flag was thrown, such as a mixed pixel or ice, um, or no image was possible for that location for another reason. So the mobile app only reports detects of cyanobacteria at the pin pixel location. Demonstration um, of this where the location of the pin has no detection for the first two weeks, but there was detection on July 6th, 29th, and the June 1st weekly images. So these are the images the app pulls for display to the device that you're working from. Next slide. And these screenshots from the mobile app as well show weekly data as a time series for each pin location. Uh, in this case, we provide validation against the 25, I believe, state health advisories issued in 2017. And this is across seven states. And this, again, was in that publication there um, that came out last year, Environmental Modeling and Software. Um, for the four pin locations, the weekly data were then compared to the timing and duration of health advisories that were issued. And those are shows as um, superimposed gray lines. And with that, I'd like to hand the presentation over to Blake. Thank you. Thank, thanks, John. I appreciate it. So John gave an overall background on a little bit of the data, um, how we're processing it, and how we're delivering it, and a little overview of the app itself. What I'm going to do is just briefly walk through um, an orientation of the app, kind of step by step, and some different ways you may want to use the app. Um, there is a more extensive training that we do have on YouTube that's available that walks through a number of different scenarios. I'm going to just kind of give two examples uh, for brevity today. So in our step-by-step -step training, uh, let's go ahead and start in. If you open the app for the first time, this is generally what the splash screen will look like when it comes up. Um, it's just a reminder. Uh, like John said, there are errors in our data set, um, and you just need to be cognizant of that when you're looking at the app that we're providing. Uh, if you don't ever want to see this again, we understand that, and you can just click the little box here that says, don't show this screen, and it won't pop up again. Um, you can also, you can see right now, um, you're looking basically at uh, an image of Google Earth. 
And I don't know about you, but when I'm trying to pan around the United States, uh, a topographic map like this isn't, isn't very helpful without borders and boundaries to kind of georeference yourself to. So one thing you can easily do is go down in the bottom right and click on Google Earth and switch things over to Google Maps and you'll see the map will load. And now you get a little bit easier for reference, uh, especially since you might be focused in on a specific state or specific lake uh, that you want to hone in on. For this particular example, we're going to focus on Utah Lake in the state of Utah. So just like many other app applications, um, are, you can zoom in using the plus and minus buttons. So if we click to zoom in here, you can see we're starting to pan in towards um, Utah Lake. And then John mentioned that if you drop a single pin, that pin is going to pull only the data where there's actually cyanobacteria detections in the satellite imagery. So I'm going to do an example where I'll drop a pin. You'll see the loading sign pop up. And then it's going to report the most recent cell count based on that um, sequence John provided a few slides back. And in this particular example, the slides are getting a little older here. Uh, you can see that the most recent hit was from uh, June 15th, uh, 2019. And it's telling you what the current concentration is, so about over 2 million cells per, per mil, and if that concentration increased from the previous detection. So it did, it, it more than doubled in concentration. If you click, so one easy way to get an idea of, so a lot of questions we, we got sent to us was, how do I know if I click on an area, if I might be missing information since the app's only going to report from the pin uh, if there's a detection or not. To get around that, we created this view latest, Im latest image button. So if you click on that, you'll get a loading because now the app is pinging, pinging our servers requesting the satellite image. And now you'll get this nice little tile. The square tile that you see here is the same tile John showed a few slides back where the United States was broken up by those white lines. This is how we have broken up the United States in our processing. It makes things a little bit easier because for you to download the entire United States to your phone would be quite a, quite a bit of data usage uh, and quite a lot of band, bandwidth on our part as well. So this is just pulling a tile, um, a, a specific size, and then you can go ahead and you can change the transparency. So there's a transparency slider here. If you zoomed into the middle of this square tile, it might be a little hard to, to reference where you are within that tile. So if you move the transparency slider over, now you can use that reference base map to pan around and move. Um, if we zoom in back to Utah Lake, you can see we can overlay both um, the actual image itself. So you can see most of the lake in this particular image looks pretty good, except for maybe the southern portion, there's some detections. And then you can still reference where you are in terms of roads and, and different locations uh, from Google Maps. If we go back, the back arrow at the top left will bring you back to the main splash screen again. Let's say you want to keep that location and you don't like the name that it pulls. And I'll just mention the name it's pulling is pulling from Google Maps. We have not given the lakes or the locations names. It's just referencing it based on Google Maps. So if you don't like that it says Provo Bay number two, you can just hit your delete button a couple of times and then save it to whatever you want. Um, in this case, we're just saying Provo Bay. The other thing that you'll notice is there's some color coding. Uh, we use a, a frequently um, referenced stoplight color nomenclature. Um, you can change that color no nomenclature in the top right by uh, clicking on the little cogwheel. If we click on that, this allows your color uh, stoplight nomenclature to change a little bit. Uh, a number of people have asked us for the ability to indicate something that's exceeded a threshold uh, as an alert. So if you click on that, the app will identify um, when you look through it that a specific pin exceeded this value of a million cells per mil in it. It will not send you an email or, or ping like a um, like if you got a, an email in your inbox or something like that. We're still trying to figure out how, how to make that happen. But if you have the app open, you'll see that that particular pin has a little, it's like a, a little um, triangular explanation point um, in, next to that pin. 
You can also modify the color code. So let's say that maybe um, uh, over, anything over a million for very high isn't what you're comfortable with, and you want to reduce that down to anything over 500,000. You can just move these slider bars, and then you can see now anything above 500,000 would be marked with a red pin, and all the other colors readjust accordingly. And you can just click on Reload Data, and the new information will come up. So here we've dropped the second pin, and you can see our pin is uh, below 200,000. So the color coding is referenced in, in yellow. And if we just click off the map, you can see now we have two different pins in two different locations with two different concentrations. Um, you can see a list of these if you select the My Locations tab. Uh, and so you, here you can see our two points. You can see Provo Bay has been renamed the way we renamed it. And here you can see, because we said we wanted to get a, a notice if there was anything above a million cells per mil, here's that little notification mark that pops up because we have exceeded 100, uh, over a million cells per mil. If I select um, this uh, Goshen Valley again, this brings us back to the map, but now you see on the bottom a slider bar of all the satellite images. And what that's doing is, remember when John said that PIN is searching for any image that has a, a hit of cyanobacteria at that specific pixel where that PIN is placed. And so what this is doing is it's going through and finding every single image for the current calendar year that has data at that particular location of a cyanobacteria detection. If you click on this pin one more time, this will bring you again to the most recent image that has um, some type of detection at that particular pin location. You can pan around with your fingers just like you would on any other type of map um, application software in your smartphone, and you can zoom in uh, and see uh, not only this lake, but other lakes within that tile as well. To go back, you can just hit the top left back arrow and then you're, you're back in that um, same screen. And you can click any one of these um, tiles and it would bring you to that particular date. If you want to see something like a time series that John had mentioned a little bit earlier, you can click on the top right, there is a chart option. And now you will see a time series of events of detections of cyanobacteria in that particular location where your pin is located for the year. Um, we've done some beta testing with a number of different groups, and uh, initially we were hosting multiple years worth of data, and overwhelmingly the response we got was people requesting that we only keep the current calendar year because that's what most people were focused on. So right now the app has data for all of 2019, and in 2020 um, we will probably remove the 2019 data and we will start uploading it with 2020 data. All right. The other option is you'll see in the center here is an imagery tab. If we click on that, again, this brings up images um, for any point that has a hit at that particular pin at this Goshen Valley location that we've selected. If you wanted to, you could select a date range. If you want to narrow things down, say specifically to uh, a date in February, um, you could modify that date, click OK, and then it's going to find, click, you can click on that, um, location and it will pull up that particular date. Uh, so that's how you can bounce between dates as well. So this is just a general overview of how you can drop a pin and track the information. You can do this for recreational waters. So if there are waters where there's a recreational beach, you can drop pins, you can drop multiple pins around that beach, basically kind of surrounding the beach to get see if there's any detections in those beaches. Um, you may be able to do this for drinking water intakes as well. Uh, and you may be able to do it if you have sampling locations where you can drop pins at your sampling locations. There is an option you can directly input G, um, GPS coordinates into the app, which I'm not going to get in today, but that's another option in the app that you can explore as well. And then finally, I'll just end um, the overview with a, a really kind of neat functionality that I don't really think you can get anywhere else. Um, our goal here was to develop a software tool that could be easily put in the hands of people to empower them with information. And our target audience we knew doesn't have a specialized expertise in satellite remote sensing. Like John said, you don't need that specialized skill set to handle, to actually go and dig for the data, and then you need specialized software to open the information. 
So this is really putting the power of information in your hands. And what's unique here is if you have multiple pins dropped, uh, and here I strategically dropped pins up and down the East Coast and in the, in, um, the Great Lakes. And what I've done here is I've selected a pin location in each one of those square tiles that John showed in the map earlier. So if you remember, like Florida had a square around it and that was one tile that we had created. And there was another tile that covered most of Georgia and South Carolina moving up the East Coast. So this is how I use the app quite a bit on a weekly basis. If you wanna get an overview of how things are changing, usually the app's updated on a Tuesday or Wednesday. And so for this week, um, this Tuesday and Wednesday, the app's been updated. And what you're looking at is all the imagery that was collected last week. So there is a one week lag period um, because we have to wait for all the data to be collected so we can compile it and push it out to you. What you can now do is you can click on, let's say this pin in Miami, and then select the view latest image. So now I'm looking essentially at the entire state of Florida, and you can pan and zoom around the state, and you can see where there may be problems uh, and where you may want to focus resource efforts or where areas may be okay, and you don't need to worry about them um, right away. You can then go back to the main splash page, and we can click now in South Carolina and click view latest image, and now we've moved up the East Coast. Um, now we're looking at a tile, um, apologies, that wasn't South Carolina, um, this was the North Carolina example, but now you can see we're seeing a large chunk of Ohio, Virginia, and North Carolina, and parts of Tennessee and Kentucky uh, in this scene. And again, you can pan around and zoom to see what detections are there. You can back out, and you can move again up the East Coast, view latest image, and now you're seeing uh, a lot of the Chesapeake Bay, the, the coastal area of North Carolina, New Jersey, Delaware, and again, you can move up, further up into Elbus Point, select view latest image, and now you're seeing all of the New England area. And um, just to kind of finish things out, um, moving towards the Great Lakes, now you can see basically the entire Great Lakes. So you can see how this can become a very powerful tool within a matter of minutes, we've just panned up the entire East Coast and into the Great Lakes of the most recent images, um, at least when we took these particular screenshots, um, to give you an idea where there may be issues and where there may be um, efforts that need, need to be um, put forward. And with that, I will stop there. And I think John and I are ready to take any questions. Thank you so much, John and Blake, for this really interesting presentation. Um, if you would like to ask a question, please use the Q&A box. Right now I have, besides scrolling around the view latest image, is there a way in the app to see all the locations where there is data and detections? Um, the, the, the best way to do that, uh, not for all images on all times, um, but in terms of the most recent set of data for the most recent week, the way I just displayed it by viewing latest image, that shows you everything, whether there's detections or not in a particular location. Is this app only compatible with Android OS? Sean, do you want to take that? Yeah, so currently, yes. Um, and there was a strategic decision made early on because that, that really sped up the development effort and uh, the requirements for um, the Apple OS uh, were different. And um, so, yes, in the, in, in the immediate time frame, um, Google Play and Android devices are where we are um, that's not to say others haven't figured out ways of doing emulation. Um, and I think Blake has been in contact with some of those folks as well where they're running it um, within the Microsoft OS um, on their desktop. And um, so just to hit that other point home that I mentioned earlier, um, the, the reason to target um, Android and, um, and, and get beta test and get feedback is that we weren't ever planning on stopping there. The, um, the responsive web app that is across devices and operating systems through a browser um, is where we're going to be um, next year. Um, 
And so that web browser will function even on a desktop computer using just your um, web browser on your desktop or your mobile device, right? Yep. Yeah. Are the cells per milliliter data used for validation from actual cell counts from laboratory analysis or estimated based on chlorophyll or phycocyanin? Okay, so John showed, let me see if we can scroll back real quick. Yeah, pull up um, that slide, yeah. Let me see, okay. This slide here is against chlorophyll A um, lab measurements uh, using a bench fluorometer that we got from the water quality portal. Uh, and a number of other uh, publicly available, any publicly available sources. So a lot of people probably on the line have contributed to the water quality portal. And that's where this particular data set come, came from looking at chlorophyll A in, in the lab. The next slide, I believe, yes. This slide here, when we're looking in the cells per mil, that is someone going, that's comparing against someone going in a boat, taking a grab sample, settling the cells and doing a microscopic count. So yes, um, it's, it's both. We've done it against the chlorophyll A um, fluorometric, fluorometric method in the laboratory, and we've done it against the uh, laboratory analysis cell count uh, methodology under a microscope. Does wave height and frequency affect the data? It can, it can cause um, glint artifacts. So uh, if you've ever been flying over a plane looking down at a body of water and you have that reflection of light uh, back in your eye, um, it can cause some, some glint issues. And that's one of the quality of flags that um, we're working on trying to uh, apply. In some of our earlier images, um, the way you know you have that issue is, and I don't know that we see it so much in our most recent version of the data, but our initial version of the data, the instead of having some smooth bloom that's kind of coherent and you can see swirls of, of the, you know, the colors and everything, um, it looked very pixelated. Um, and that was an artifact of, of glint probably from wave action and also sun angle from the viewing angle of the instrument. How are cyanoblooms distinguished from other types of phytoplankton blooms? So very generally, um, in some of the papers that we have uh, referenced, specifically the one that's on the screen, the Lunetta et al. paper, describes this methodology um, in a little bit more detail for those who want a better technical reference. But very generally what's happening is we're looking at the fluorescence of, of the chlorophyll signature in the green and red parts of the spectrum. And then we're seeing the phycocyanin pigment when it's, when it's also in the water kind of suppresses that signature. And we're looking at the difference um, in the overall signature and how it's modified based on the presence of phycocyanin. So um, again, if you want more details, I would suggest looking at the Lunetta paper. And I should mention, I believe all the papers that we reference, uh, we've paid for open access rights. So there should be no need to pay for the literature um, to see the information. Um, you should be able to access it for free. What is the smallest size in acres of a lake that would appear on the app? That's a hard question because you, lakes aren't perfectly circular or square. And so I would say roughly, if your lake is about three football fields across, um, you're probably going to get some type of information um, passed through uh, in the app. The best way to check is to open up the app, um, find your lake of interest, and see if there is data being passed through um, with the 2019 data. But basically the guidance, the, the best, easiest uh, guidance to give uh, is just if you're about three football fields across, you, you might have a good chance of getting some data. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add that in testing the app for water bodies that I was familiar with, um, the one that's in our neighborhood that's a six or seven acre uh, lake is long and narrow and that obviously doesn't show up. Um, but uh, north of town, Athens, there's a, a lake with a, um, a nature center, and it's somewhere in the order of 50 to 100 acres. Um, and again, it's not a 
wide reservoir. It's, um, it is an impoundment, um, but it's not one that's, it's not one you'd think of as being large and used for a lot of fishing and boating. Um, but it does have uh, enough um, extent in both dimensions that there are cells that, uh, you know, not the entire extent of the lake, but um, there were a handful that, that showed up and had data for, uh, uh, for cyanoblooms. Is the app limited to CONUS locations? If so, are there any plans to expand worldwide? Um, I think we like that question. Um, it, it would be great to expand worldwide. The reality is um, it's, it's very expensive what we're doing for the entire United States operationally uh, as it is. Um, I do think there are, John, correct me if I'm wrong, there's some parts of the southern extent uh, along can, the Canadian border that are included, correct? Correct, yeah. Um, we have included Alaska, not in the app, but in our initial processing kind of behind the scenes. Um, but that hasn't been pushed uh, to the app, and that was done at the request of Region 10 in Alaska. Um, there's been a lot of discussions about going to an international model, but there, that would be a, a much larger extensive effort uh, that would require a lot more manpower and a lot, a lot more people involved that at the moment the project is not scaled for. Can you please talk more about how people are using the app in the field and how the app fits into a more holistic monitoring and response program that includes ground truthing? Um, I, I know that there's been a couple of news articles um, where people have used the app to identify where there might be potentially blooms and then they've gone out and either uh, verified there have been balloons or made a call um, to whatever the local agency is that's responsible for that particular water body for additional testing. Um, I know there was a newspaper article, I believe there was a tribe in New York that used the app and there was a health advisory issued uh, after there was a confirmation of the bloom. Uh, I know there's some river keepers who have been using it to help them orientate um, how representative their sampling may be. In terms of validation, uh, I think this is a great potential for citizen science. So it can do two things. One, if there are citizen science groups who are trying to detect where these blooms are, it may help them orientate uh, where to focus. And two, if they are collecting information on where the blooms are, it certainly could be used for validation. Although again, our particular project doesn't have that scope in place to engage with the citizen science aspect of things. And John, I don't know if you have other examples or not. But. No, what about that example um, of the agency that went out and sampled but missed the start of the bloom? Yeah, yeah. so uh, one example, this wasn't particularly with the app, but with the, the data that we have been providing, um, the state of Utah went out and sampled um, in preparation for the 4th of July holiday, uh, didn't identify anything. Uh, and then the following week, the the imagery detected the start of a bloom and they returned the following week and confirmed there was a bloom and toxins in the water and a health advisory was issued prior to 2000 uh, to the 4th of July holiday. I know there is a few there are a few other states who've been using the, the imagery to help guide um, where health advisories may occur again all with confirmations of, of field support as well. You stated that you will likely delete the information from previous years. Could you consider maintaining a rolling 12 month and or historic period year record? Yep, that, that's definitely something the team has debated whether it should be a rolling 12 months or um, that just so it's clear, we're not deleting all the archives of the data. We're just um, removing the data from the app because the more data that's on the app, the longer it will take to for the app to respond, but certainly um, a rolling year is something we've certainly discussed. Uh, I don't know if you want to. If there's anything else you want to add to that, John, or not? But no, I think as we as we try to support more of those um, longer term, um, you know, the folks that are out in the field then maybe even have their own data set they'd like to compare. They'd like to have that longer. Um, historical record um, that we might be able to supply. It, it's going to come on down to the 
the, that benefit cost of can we do it in a way that doesn't change the uh, response uh, depending on different bandwidths for connection speed people have. You, know, you wouldn't want to put so much in there as you're saying that would render it um, non-responsive. Um, or you start to load and it might take minutes um, before you even get a status return. So we're trying to weigh those those um, those needs with the consideration of how best to deliver that. Is it possible to pull the imagery into GIS? I'm guessing there isn't possible. It isn't possible in the app, but is it imagery data stored somewhere it could be accessed? So. Correct. The imagery from the app can be downloaded like as a PNG file, which is just like a regular picture file. Um, the imagery that we actually create from the project side is in what's called GeoTIFF format. So it can be imported directly into GIS to do more geospatial types of analyses. Um, that data at the moment is currently only available to state agencies um, working on the um, that have efforts. Um, so that has been available to all state agencies. It will become publicly available at the end of the pro project, which is about another year and a half from now. Um, but at the moment, it's not publicly available. What kind of HABs slash toxins is the technology capable of to to de detecting? So this is specific to cyanobacteria. And that's a great question on the toxins. We are not detecting toxins. There is no direct remote sensing technology at the moment that can detect toxins. There's no optical signature that the satellites can pick up on that's toxin related. Um, and so we are only detecting the biomass of the, the cyanobacteria in freshwater systems. I should mention that um, we, we have, with working with some states out on the coasts, we have shown that we can detect cyanobacteria also in brackish systems. So, uh, you know, in estuarine areas where there's a lot of mixing and freshwater input, um, those cyanobacteria blooms that do occur in those locations, it seems to be working there as well. But we haven't done a lot of work verifying that uh, in estuaries yet. When will we when will we be able to access the data on our PCs? John? We don't have a, uh, a set date yet. We, um, we as in ORD within the Environmental Protection Agency just began our new fiscal year. And so we're um, off and running for the new development effort. Um, so far, uh, the prototype seems to be going well. Um, we're not anticipating um, that we'll have any major challenges. So it we're looking at months um, before we're testing it in the spring. So we're hoping by next summer, if not before the next recreational um, rec water season, that it would um, it'd be something we'd be able to release publicly. Are you recommending that this be used more widely by the public or more in a scientific slash water resource arena? Right. So as we mentioned a few times, our, our target audience has been always kind of the water management side of things. Um, and so that's been our target uh, in terms of stakeholders working with state departments of environment, departments of health, uh, and localities that have to deal with this, such as water utilities. And that um, if there's an additional benefit in the public having the data, then that's, that's a great additional benefit. Are there any more questions? There is a chat box if you would like to ask a question. We have about 10 more minutes left. If there are no more questions, um, thank you both John and Blake for this wonderful presentation. It was very interesting and I hope it was valuable uh, to our guests. This uh, presentation will be posted on the NEHA Preparedness webinar page as well as EPA's um, webinar outlets.
The notes will also be put, uh, posted as well. If you have any questions, you can contact Neha um, at programs. Oh, I see that there's one more question. Is the CDC partnering with other agencies such as local health departments to spread information about this app? Um, we've chatted with the CDC quite a number of times. They are uh, aware of it, and I, I, I don't know what in particular they might be doing uh, in related relationship to the app. But we are all talking to each other, and I suspect the CDC, when the conversation comes up as needed, is probably um, providing that information to them. Yes, I would, I would think so. And we have another one. When looking at long narrow reservoirs that have data, are there any constraints on the cell count? Um, I'm not sure I understand what they mean by constraints on the cell counts. Um, if it's a real long narrow reservoir and there's only maybe one pixel in, uh, in the center and then it's surrounded by land on both sides, that's a case where, like John mentioned, you may want to take a little bit more caution because there could be a, a higher likelihood of errors. One of the examples would be if you have any type of drawdown, you're going to have exposure of the sediment very quickly in that system. Now, we have tried implementing a quality flag that hopefully will address that, but we don't know if that quality flag will pick up every single scenario in every instance across the US. So yeah, a little caution should be used if you're looking at a single pixel uh, in a location and there's no other surrounding pixels that can kind of help group confirm that there may be a decent detection going on. So just exercise a little bit more caution in some of those more narrow systems, yes. Are there any more questions? Okay, I will close out the webinar for today. Thank you, EPA, and thank you, John, Blake, and Bailey. Um, again, this was a wonderful presentation, and the presentation, along with the notes, will be posted within a couple of weeks. Thank you, Christine. Thanks so much. Thank you, Christine. Thank you.